Thank you. I'm going to be talking about the uh, possibilities and challenges of, in the use of networks and the uh, the similarity with the title with uh, Tom is entirely accidental. Um, but it's uh, the structure is, is is roughly the same. For so first, I was I wanted to present uh, some stuff that uh, that network science has has to offer in the research questions that we're trying to answer in our project. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to talk in the second part of my presentation about uh, some of the, the, the major problems that uh, uh, I've seen and that I think that we can learn from in the future. Um, so the basic um, question that, uh, well, the basic methodological question then is how can network analysis be applied to better understand the functioning of transmit networks in our region? and uh, to help explain the socio-economic structure, uh, and particularly uh, if, if from an archaeological perspective relevant are the, then what is the role of individual sites in the transport networks, particularly when we're thinking about transport networks that uh, are about the local transportation from the uh, rural settlements to the military population, because we're thinking about provisioning uh, of the military that are uh, situated in the Roman fortresses along the Rhine. Um, now, our starting point uh, and where I finished in my uh, previous presentation is uh, on uh, reconstructed, are the reconstructed transport networks uh, and they are, are reconstructed least cost paths of various transport modes and these uh, straight lines that you see here in this uh, uh, in, in this Im image uh, are straight line simplified representations of these uh, modeled least cost paths. Uh, and before uh, I was going to go into network uh, analysis. I wanted to do a brief introduction of, of some network meshes, but I think don't think it's really necessary anymore. So just, uh, well, a main example, of course, is between the centrality, which is a measure of uh, the amount of paths that pass through the, th through the node, it's, uh, the node that you're uh, analyzing. Uh, so the, the, the node that you see here uh, located in the center has a very high between the centrality because it controls all movement over the network from all nodes on its left side towards all nodes on its right side and vice versa. So that's the basic idea. So I'll just no now move uh, straight, uh, straight into it. Uh, this is a network that I've uh, shown previously as well. So it's walking without carrying a load uh, in the same region, in the Kromrein region in the center of the Netherlands. Um, but now uh, the size of the circles represent between the centrality. Uh, and this is just uh, still the measurement. And now um, we are actually doing this measurement to answer an archaeological question, namely what role do individual sites play in the network? Now there are not a lot of uh, variation in sites that we can look at, but there's one particular uh, site type that stands out, which are stone-built settlements. Um, so let's first look at whether or not stone-built settlements play a role in local transport networks when we're thinking about uh, transport uh, moving from local population to the military population. Um, the stone-built settlements are represented here by uh, the dark blue dots among the lighter blue dots, and uh, they are often thought to represent a higher status or wealth in comparison to the other rural settlements. Um, now, right now, there are six stone-built settlements in the region. They don't really uh, they're not really clearly visible. There's, there's one over here. It's the largest one, and there are a couple of smaller ones over here. But in this walking without carrying a load, which is a very fairly easy mode of transportation, this uh, creates a fairly egalitarian network, where at least in, in the core of this area over here, not a lot of sites really stand out uh, of the rest of the sites. When we're actually going uh, forward into other uh, modes of transportation, such as walking while actually carrying a load, so we're actually thinking about people are moving goods through the landscape, then uh, what's immediately visible is that uh, uh, a number of sites uh, on, uh, a, on a rather linear uh, stretch of, of land uh, become very important in terms of between the centrality. And what's particularly interesting is that there are a couple of stone mill settlements here and here that uh, also belong to the to the most important uh, settlements and it's particularly interesting as well because uh, there are only six stone milled settlements and there are at least two uh, settlements here that are among the top 20 percent uh, in terms of between the centrality so you can see that that they uh, seem to play an important role we'll look uh, into it a bit more a bit further we have also mule car transport uh, where we again we see 
uh, a number of stone built settlements appear on the main uh, levee uh, on this side of on this side of the research area um, and the same goes for ox cart transport where again a number of stone built settlements uh, uh, show up among the string of important sites now we can uh, overlay the archaeological information that we have on, on transport systems in the region and this is a reconstruction, an archaeological reconstruction of, of transport, uh, uh, of uh, well, uh, actually just a reconstruction of roads. And a big red line uh, represents the military road, for which we have, of course, the most archaeological evidence, uh, the one that also connects the Roman fortresses. And what clearly shows is that it falls almost entirely outside of the main corridors of, of local transportation. So uh, outside the main corridors or of where most of the local people would have moved. Uh, in contrast, we have the uh, smaller uh, red lines, which are uh, uh, secondary roads, uh, which aren't actually constructed roads, but are uh, uh, most likely uh, mere routes. Uh, and they are also mostly uh, an archaeological interpretation by the archaeologists who made this reconstruction, because there's uh, only very limited evidence for these roads. But it turns out it's actually uh, quite a successful uh, interpretation because it lines up quite neatly with the uh, string of uh, sites that we find in our network analysis uh, that are very important. Uh, and most notably, we have the stone mill settlements uh, pop up here and here that are on intersections uh, of these secondary road systems. So our between the centrality results does suggest uh, that they uh, play an important role in the secondary road system, so the road system of the local transport, um, and perhaps in this way link up uh, the local uh, transport system uh, to the Roman Castella. Now we are trying to think of uh, different scenarios of how could local, the local population have supplied the Roman military. Um, there are two, two possible ideas that you could compare against each other. Uh, one idea is that uh, the local population would bring their goods directly from the local settlements to the military settlements. Another idea, for example, would be that there are intermediary sites where people would move there first. Now, this is a kind of question you can answer using uh, uh, network analysis as well. Uh, through uh, closeness centrality, for example. And closeness centrality is a measure of how easily a site can be reached from all other sites. And we can compare, for instance, uh, how easily an intermediary site can be reached in comparison to the other scenario where people go directly to the Castella, so how easily the Castella can be reached. Now, we have a couple of intermediary sites, so besides the stone built settlements that we've already looked at, we have a couple of intermediary sites where you can look at which are uh, Horia, so they are grain storage faci facilities. Uh, and they are, I've shown them in yellow here. They are here, here, and here. And I've measured the closeness centrality of those sites. And they are plotted in the graph on the left-hand side. And they appear to be much closer than the uh, Roman fortresses that are uh, on the Rhine itself. And it's only the ones that is on the bottom here that's a bit lower. But it's still higher, of course, than the one uh, than the fortress it's associated with, which is all the way on the edge of the area. But of course, it can also be attributed to edge effects. Um, but a uh, sh short conclusion is that uh, at least these network analysis results uh, suggest the uh, most likely scenario for uh, the provisioning of the Roman army is through uh, some sort of intermediary size. At least that would be the, the most efficient way to do it. Uh, as the Castella appear to have a peripheral role, really, in the local transport system, whereas the stone mill settlements and the grain storage facilities uh, appear to be, have a more central role in terms of between the centrality and closeness centrality uh, compared to the Roman fortresses. But of course, before we get uh, to these kind of conclusions, there are a lot of questions we have to ask ourselves. And one important question is how reliable are your network analysis results? And I've, I've looked a little bit into this, uh, so how could I possibly test uh, how reliable a network analysis result is? Because we have the data, we built a network from it, and uh, how do you go from there? So what I've, what I've tr uh, tried is to construct a model um, uh, to uh, uh, iteratively uh, uh, construct a network, uh, starting with a single site I'm going to investigate, and then uh, add, uh, add new sites over and over again, and uh, analyze uh, continuously uh, how the network meshes changes. 
And if the network measure is stable, so in, in other words, if the network measure is robust, then it would already stabilize uh, well before the entire network is uh, completely formed. Uh, and that is, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but that's represented in the orange line over here. And you can see that uh, after a bit of variation, uh, it quite quickly, about a, a third way through the formation of the network, stabilizes uh, on the value that it will have at the end of the network formation. So this is an example of a, a site with a network analysis uh, measurement uh, that is quite robust. On the other hand, we also have examples of sites with a very poor uh, uh, robustness of these network uh, measures. Uh, and this is, of course, a great example because you see the orange line continuously uh, uh, declining. Now, the basic uh, results of this is that about 70% of our network analysis results uh, are reliable, and on, other, uh, on the other hand, about 30% are unreliable. Of course, this is important to know um, because uh, it not, on not only uh, tells you something about the unreliable results, but it also... Uh, um, makes the archaeological in interpretation that you've made based on the reliable results even more reliable. Now a second important uh, uh, aspect to look at here is the choice of network construction techniques. And this is a question that came up earlier as well in the previous presentation. Um, in my earliest uh, uh, presentations at conferences, I've only used a, a, a single a network construction technique, which is a, a based on a maximum distance. So I choose a uh, a certain threshold uh, 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 below which I only include those lengths. So uh, the, this example includes only lengths that can be traveled within 30 minutes, and it works very well for the case study that I've shown because it's located in the center of the research area where site density is largest. It doesn't really work for the areas where site de density is much smaller, so we have to go look for other techniques to complement that. Now, another network construction technique that has been addressed earlier as well is uh, our proximal points uh, networks. Uh, and proximal point networks connect, uh, are networks that connect uh, to a certain uh, number of nearest neighbors. And this example shows uh, uh, a network where all, all, all sides in the network connect to their five nearest neighbors. Uh, now, this works to a certain extent, uh, uh, but there are still a number of disconnected components which uh, doesn't really work in uh, what we're actually trying to investigate, which is uh, uh, movement from the local settlements to military uh, settlements, because um, it, you, can't you can't reach the military settlements from the local settlements, so that's a problem. Um, then another one, which is more of a mathematical uh, network construction technique, are Gabriel graphs. And Gabriel graphs are based on a mathematical principle that no other point uh, is in the circle, uh, uh, bet uh, in the circle uh, where the diameter of the circle are the uh, line between two other points. Uh, now this is a, a kind of a pseudo Gabriel graph actually, because it a normal Gabriel graph would use uh, geographic space, whereas uh, because my precisely because my links are based on uh, on time uh, as a cost per unit, I've uh, constructed a Gabriel graph in temporal space. Um, but it w looks almost the same, so there's not really much of a difference, but there are, are minor variations there. Um, and finally, there's a global efficiency graph. Um, and global efficiency starts with a minimum spanning tree, so connecting all the sites. And then from there on, add links that improve the efficiency of the network as a whole. And the first link, for instance, that would be added is the purple one in the bottom. And that makes sense because it uh, connects the uh, western part and the eastern parts of the network through the southern corridor. And you can continually see, uh, uh, add more links to that. And it, it looks very weird, but you have to uh, remember that uh, these uh, straight lines are still simplified representations of Liskov paths that net are not necessarily uh, straight lines. Now we can actually compare uh, these various network construction techniques by referring back again to our initial que original uh, questions because we're interested in moving uh, from the local population to the military population. So we could compare them, for instance, based on a network measure called average path length. So the average time it takes you to reach the a certain Roman fortress from all other settlements. Now the best performance here is uh, shown by proximal point networks and Gabriel networks whereas the maximum distance networks and uh, proximal point networks with a low number of neighbors don't, uh, don't work at all because the, the entire network is not connected. 
now you can ask yourself is this really important because it's probably very unlikely that you want to move from one side to the, of the region to the uh, all the way to the other side of the region so perhaps it's more relevant to look at local average path length which I've done uh, here, showing the local average path length that it takes to reach a Roman fortress from the 55 settlements that are nearest to that Roman fortress. And here you can actually uh, start comparing uh, as well the uh, maximum distance networks. Uh, that work so the maximum distance networks work fairly well on the local scale, uh, but they still will have the downside that they have a, a ridiculously high amount of uh, uh, connections uh, with, on, uh, with uh, a single site on average uh, connecting to uh, 40 neighbors. So that's a bit, bit uh, on the unre unrealistic side of things. So probably still the proximal point uh, graphs with a high number of neighbors and the Gabriel graph would be the most, uh, 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 well, the closest to realistic uh, representation of a, a, a local transport network uh, to model transport going from local population to the military population. Uh, and now you might remember that I, in, earlier I tried making a case uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, maybe there were intermediary sites rather than people going directly to the Roman settlements itself. So we can take again these intermediary sites as well and see how they compare uh, in this network performance. Um, and in all networks uh, observed, they actually uh, perform better uh, uh, than the Roman fortresses. This, so again, this supports the earlier ideas that uh, perhaps there were intermediary sites uh, uh, active in the provisioning of the Roman army. So concluding remarks, uh, the network analysis uh, results suggest a provisioning system uh, that works through intermediary sites rather than directly through the Roman fortresses themselves. Uh, but they are not always re reliable and can always benefit from sensitivity analysis. Uh, furthermore, different network construction techniques, as I've shown, of course, can yield very different outcomes, which is not surprising, but should be based on uh, the choice that you make should be based on uh, which archaeological questions you are trying to answer. And with that uh, concluding remark, I would like to uh, close my presentation. Thank you.